at some point in your Air Force career, be it towards the end of your initial service commitment or after 20 years of active duty service, you may be thinking about switching over to civilian aviation. If and when this ever does occur, you'll find that applying to the airlines will be drastically different than any other job that you've ever applied for. Because of this, Millkeep and Cockpit to Cockpit provided this webinar for you from flight suit to first officer. This webinar is designed as a very high 30,000 foot view of what lies ahead for anyone looking to apply for the major airlines. In order to help you along with this process, Millkeep and Cockpit to Cockpit developed this checklist that is available for you at usafa.org slash career center under the pilot transition button. Getting ready to transition to the airlines is a multi-year process. The basic steps are ordered in a chronological fashion. And on the right hand side, you can enter an expected separation date from active duty to let you know if you're on or off glide path towards the transition to civilian aviation. The easiest thing anyone can do is to keep a meticulous logbook of your flights. This is because the Air Force and FAA requires pilots to log time very differently. One of the most important data points to the airlines is pilot in command or PIC time, which is the time logged as the aircraft commander on record. For single-seat aircraft, this isn't much of an issue, but for crew aircraft, pilots will have to make educated estimates if they haven't been keeping track personally. The reference material for both Air Force and FAA are listed below. The bottom line is there is more than one way to convert your records. If you haven't kept a meticulous logbook of your flights and only have your harm folder, there are some things that you need to remember. The HARM, or Host Aviation Resource Management Office, is the directorate in charge of maintaining all flight records. Up until September of 2019, all flight record data older than 18 months was not stored electronically. The system was forced to purge all line entries every 18 months. The only data remaining, which is older than 18 months, was summary totals. If records contained typo errors or duplicated, which can happen frequently, the only thing pilots have to reference back to are the paper records, which can be lost, damaged, or stolen. In the fall of 2019, the Air Force announced that harm offices will no longer keep paper records. A new system called AMS will hold all flights electronically, but it will store flights from September 2019 and forward. It will not have any other historical data, and it can hold up to 10 years worth of flights. It's uncertain at this time what actions will be taken for those anticipating a flying career longer than 10 years, but one thing is for certain. Individuals should have another way to store your flight records outside of official Air Force systems to prevent data loss. Another thing to consider is that Air Force harm records do not delineate who was the A code on any specific flight. Because of this, many pilots who didn't keep accurate records use a percentage of their total time to estimate PIC time. The first thing to use that converted civilian logbook for is your airline transport pilot or ATP certificate. Accurate civilian records are necessary to prove the 1500 total minimum hours required to qualify for your FAA checkride. An ATP is an absolute must for applying to the majors. Regional airlines provide some leniency to apply without the ATP and some even pay for your ATP, but not major airlines. The new ATP CTP program requirement was established in 2014, and it consists of 30 hours of ground instruction and 10 hours of simulator time, six of which must be conducted in a level C or D full motion simulator. Then pilots qualify to sit for a pilot knowledge test and a practical flight test. Companies exist that can package everything for you, and this can cost anywhere between four and $9,000, depending on what you need. Bottom line, you wanna get your ATP and start the process as soon as possible. Besides flight records, which are needed for the ATP applications, interviews, etc., there are a number of other items required in order to begin building your application portfolio. First, you're going to need all of your transcripts all the way back to high school and for every degree that you've earned. You're going to need your flight evaluation folder with all of your checkride records. You'll need your driving records, but only for applications on airlineapps.com, United, and Delta. You'll need your passport, you also need some civilian specific items that are your FCC radio operators permit and FAA first class medical. Next up, you'll need to create a civilian resume. These aren't difficult as much as time consuming. Just make sure that the times on your resume match the times listed on your applications. The 
other most time-consuming process is getting letters of recommendations from all of your colleagues who've already made the leap. It's always better to have recommendations from employees of the airline that you're targeting. The more senior ranking, the better. Ideally, at least five letters of recommendation are recommended for each airline that you're targeting. If you're looking for more information on any of the documents listed here, both Millkeep and Cockpit to Cockpit websites have links and resources for everything that you may need. Once you have everything put together, you can start the application process. Now, applications should be submitted approximately 12 months before your availability date. It's helpful to have a printout of your latest security clearance application when filling out airline applications for things like address history, employment history, supervisor contact information, etc. The most popular airline application sites are AirlineApps.com and PilotCredentials.com. Some airlines, such as FedEx and Southwest, recommend only using their site for their applications. More importantly, though, these sites have very different accounting methods when asking pilots to report their time, and we'll go into these differences now. The mantra that you want to follow for AirlineApps.com when inputting your time is to make it all add up. In the Air Force, the component times, primary, secondary, instructor, evaluator, and other time, are always required to add up to your total time. Now, this isn't necessarily required in the FAA, but that's how you want to do it for AirlineApps.com. You want all of your civilian component times all to equal your total time. For this, since there's no evaluator column, you want your instructor time to equal all of your instructor plus your evaluator time in the Air Force. You want to have separate instructor time from your PIC time. So think here of your PIC time as Basic Aircraft Commander PIC and the instructor block as Instructor PIC. The other block should be used for any other time that is not allocated towards PIC. Some people like to allocate portion of their other time towards PIC when they were the aircraft commander on file. Some do not. The choice is yours. However, you also want to make sure that you do not include any UAV or RPA time when applying for the airlines. The major airlines that use pilotcredentials.com, however, would like you to log time differently. The main difference between airlineapps.com and pilotcredentials.com is that with airlineapps.com, you're supposed to make it all add up. So you break apart your basic PIC time and your instructor PIC time. With pilotcredentials.com, they want you to include your instructor time in your PIC block. For example, if you had 500 hours of basic PIC time and 500 hours of instructor time, the instructor block would be 500 but the PIC block would be 1,000. For this, there's also no student or dual column, so your SIC is going to equal your SIC time plus your dual student time. Also, there is no other time block for pilotcredentials.com, but you'll also notice that there is no total time for you to fill in. This is all calculated on the back end of their system. While you're applying, it may also help to have a company review your application for you or work with a company on interview preparation. There are several aspects of the interview that you may want to brush up on. First is your logbook review. This can either go very quickly during the first day or it can go very poorly depending on how much you have prepared. You could also get help with aviation knowledge tests, panel interviews, cognitive skills tests that you may have to take, the line oriented interview, or personality screening tests. American uses the organization fit assessment as part of their application. United is going to invite you to take the Hogan personality test prior to your interview invite. In Delta, you'll take the MMPI on day two of the interview, but only if you get a CJO after day one. Now, hopefully, you'll get several offers from multiple airlines. What's the most important thing to consider when choosing your next employer? For airline jobs, most pilots agree that seniority is everything because it determines your flying schedule and upgrade timelines to larger aircraft, captain, all which translate into pay and better quality of life. Location, also known as your domicile, is another huge factor. Commuting can have a huge impact on your quality of life. Pay is relatively even across the airlines, so increasing your salary is typically tied directly to how quickly you can upgrade in that airline. A good website to find this information is AirlinePilotCentral.com, which will show mandatory retirements for all airlines over the next 20 or so years. The higher the number of mandatory retirements for that airline, the faster you can gain seniority. Also, you might want to consider the financial strength of the company as a good indicator for job security. 
Airlines that carry heavy debt are much less stable in a down economy. Culture is another important consideration. How a company treats its pilots can make a huge difference. Nobody wants to go to work at a place where everyone is miserable. Any airline with a long history of labor disputes and or multiple unsettled mergers is likely to have similar problems. How does the airline treat military members if they're still in the reserves of the guard? They're all very important things, but all of the above that we just discussed lead to the better quality of life and choosing the right thing for you. So that's the 30,000 foot view of what lies ahead for anyone looking to apply for the major airlines. Don't forget to revisit the AOG website under the Career Center for the quick reference checklist that we developed. And as always, if you want any more links or resources, visit Cockpit to Cockpit or Milkeep. Thanks.